Hello, this is Debbie Dashinger, host of the Dare to Dream podcast. Today's show features a native Peruvian healer, Puma Freddy Quispe Singona is here, and I'll be speaking with him. He is an Andean medicine man. Dare to Dream podcast won the COV award for best radio and podcast show. Welp magazine named Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, one of the best 20 podcasts. Tw top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It's also very high ranking self-improvement in Apple Podcasts and nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award. My gratitude to our sponsors. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. You can join one of their classes or become a facilitator. Go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R dot com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a book writing coach. I also take your book to a guaranteed international best-selling status, and I do all the heavy lifting. And I'm a boutique publicist where I get people booked on radio and podcast shows. I've just delivered a free live masterclass, and it was tips on how to get booked on podcast and media media bookings. I plan to do another one, but in the interim, if you'd like some gifts around that, so you can learn how to up your visibility and your game and get your message out there at a time when you definitely came here to do that, go to my website and download your gifts today. It's debbie-dashinger.com slash gift, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. And you can start being interviewed and learn all about visibility. My guest today, Freddie, and we're going to call him Puma throughout, and I joked with him and said he can call me Lion, but he truly is Puma, Freddie, Kispe, Singona, and he was trained by his grandfather, Don Maximo, in the mastery of Andean ceremonies and rituals as a spiritual leader, both in his own community in Peru and in international gatherings and spiritual journeys, Puma has a passion for the teachings of his people and a profound respect for the global awakening of human consciousness. He has attended and facilitated numerous international gatherings of spiritual leaders and young leaders. He's recognized globally as a holder of ancient lineage wisdom and the power to inspire people in a special heartfelt way to connect. Puma works with youth groups and has a natural ability to connect with ancestral spirits, cosmic forces, and natural elementals that assist him in his global healing path. As a tour guide to the natural wonders and sacred sites of Peru, and the Quechua world, he has deep reverence for the traditions and values of the ancient Andean cultures. His website will be in the show notes if you'd like to find out more about him. It's N-O-Q-A-N-K-A-N-I dot com. And with that, I welcome Puma to the Dare to Dream show. It is so nice to have you here. Welcome. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, everybody. Very happy to be here to share our sacred wisdom, our sacred traditions of the Andes. It's a powerful time to be doing this. And I want to start with the inception of all of this for you. So you were born in the highlands of Chinchero in the Andean region of Peru. And at the age of six, such a baby, at the age of six, you began training with your grandfather in the ways of the Andean medicine man. So first, I'm curious, tell me about your grandfather, Don Maximo, his gifts, and what was your relationship like with him? Uh, for me, everything began, you know, as a child, and my grandfather was one of the last carriers of a very ancestral lineage that was passed on generation after generation. And... Um, I was blessed to receive his teachings about ceremonies, about rituals, about energy work. And since it started so early, it was all for me like playing. It was all just having fun, being on the mountains, learning about energy and elementals, uh, just gr growing up with a sense of communion mm -hmm. and oneness with nature, with spirit. So. It all began as, as a play, as, as a children's play games. 
it was a natural way to enter into these powerful traditions. Incredible. And so I imagine somewhere along the lines with that play, there was magic. If <laughs> Right? Th you must have been able to see things that other people didn't see. Maybe you experienced other things. Can you talk a little bit about that? So first here in the Andes, we learn about uh, ceremony. Mm -hmm. And uh, ceremony is... Uh, whatever sacred space, whatever sacred time we bless and we become conscious of. Uh, we learn that ceremony is not ours, but it's for us. We learn first that uh, the sun, the moon, the stars are in ceremony. Mother Earth is in ceremony. Uh, spirit forces are in ceremony and they're in ceremony for you. So when you bless your sacred space and your sacred time, you are joining their ceremony. And you realize that the main reason why there is even ceremony is for you. You are the center of it. So that's why we bless our whole life, regardless what we're doing in it, whether we are working, whether we are playing, it is all happening within sacred time, sacred space. So it's always ceremony. And that's the first thing we learn. And as we learn that, we, we have a much uh, deeper communion and a better understanding of whatever we're going through in life, emotionally, psychologically, physically. And um, we learn to be um, highly perceptive and highly sensitive to energies, to uh, omens, signs, uh, whether it's sounds, whether it's colors, and we develop those senses in an acute way so much that we can also travel through these parallel dimensions. We learn that life is not happening only in this third dimension, but we are uh, also present in thousands of worlds at the same time. And that is what I used to love to do with my grandfather. We used to go up to the mountaintops and we would um, choose a time in the past we would journey to or what used to happen with our ancestors or sometimes we used to journey to what might happen in the future so that we are preparing ourselves consciously for the new generations, for the new era, for the new times. So we used to travel through dimensions of time. We used to travel through dimensions of space because we can do that. Only as human beings have that power to be interdimensional. We have that natural gift. We are existing in a thousand places in a thousand of a second, but we're not conscious of them. And that's what we learn in the traditions here in the Andes. We learn to travel through these powerful dimensions consciously. And we choose where we want to go, why we want to go there. And then when we come back from this uh, astral traveling, spirit traveling through these powerful dimensions, we always bring new knowledge. We always bring wisdom. We always bring what we call alchemic gold. And that is for our family, for our community, so this is what we used to do. You know, we used to go out to the mountains and while we were working on the potato fields or raising our animals, we, we used to learn about these powerful dimensions of life, of the spirit. And um, it was always fun. It was always very powerful. And that in order to be a best healer, mm -hmm. a global healer in these times, that training, all that preparation was for me to work with our global family in ceremony with powerful rituals to facilitate, accelerate, support the healing process that we are going through globally. So if I understand you correctly, because you then referred to it as astral travel, so your body remained here, but your being... Yes right? Your particles and your consciousness yeah. awareness went someplace else. And 
that's a question, but I'm also curious, especially if you went to the past, if you were ever able to facilitate a change in something that would have made a better now or future. Uh, when we go to the past, definitely we're um, going for powerful changes now and then for the future, uh, as the past can no longer be changed. So here in the Andes, we believe that uh, our past is in front of us. It's not behind us. It's in front of us. And, what do you mean by that? And our future is behind us because we don't pass. Time passes by you. So as it's passing by you, it leaves. And that's why you can always see your past. You can always <laughs> contemplate it. You can always see it. And because the future is a time that is trying to catch up as much as it can with this moment, it's always behind and you can't see it. Right. Though you can sense it and you can be connected with it. So you can program it. Astral traveling for us is a very important practice. I mean, it has been throughout the planet, but especially here, uh, even without our eyes closed, we used to journey, you know, our consciousness journeys through these parallel dimensions. And for example, one, one time I traveled to the past that I feel was very important was when I came back from school and I was very upset to the Spaniards that have conquered and hurt and destructed our culture. And um, I told them that uh, I was so angry to these people that they came here and they caused so much destruction and my grandfather said to me, let's journey to that past. Why would you be afraid for yourself? Why would you be angry to yourself? Let's go there. So when we journeyed to the past, to the times when the Spaniards were coming, in one, pa in one part of the journey, my grandfather asks, who are you? Are you the person who is waiting in this land? Or are you on a horse arriving to this place with the Spaniards? And I discovered that I was actually one of the Spaniards. And completely my feelings and my perception changed. I, at this point, all that anger completely disappeared. And what I had was guilt. So my grandfather helped me transform all that guilt. He said, now you need to forgive yourself for everything you have been a part of. And um, when you forgive yourself, you will liberate yourself. For the rest of your life, you will never feel anger again for any colonizing or con conquering uh, Spaniard. You will, have, you will have healed completely all those feelings. And that was true. Ever since, I, I have not felt that anger or resentment of, you know, the conquest of the Spaniards, because I learned that none, nothing is, exists separate from you. Not the Inca people, not the Spanish uh, people, not any lineage. All lineages are here for you, and none of them is yours. So grandfather always used to say, that's why we have this saying here, nothing is yours because everything is for you. Nothing is yours because everything is for you. What a very powerful story. That's amazing. I mean, I'm just thinking I'm Jewish and, you know, you know, my history. <laughs> um, and that begs me to consider what if I was even a Nazi, right? And if I were to travel back and I could see whatever pain or misnomer would create a person into becoming that and enacting some of those horrors. Um, that's very powerful what you just said. And it gives a whole nother level to the idea like when people say everything is energy, they're also saying we are everything, period, infinitely everything and everyone. So there's no blame and I am that and you are this, right? For us, uh, this, this is very important because we live 
in a world of polarities mm -hmm. and dualities. Um, uh, yes. And the, the first and most important duality we learn about is energy, heavy energy and light energy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we are in a planet where you have to live with the day and the night, mm -hmm. with the dark and the light, with the beautiful and the ugly, with the good and the bad. Um, you have no choice. When you are here, you have to exist with both. But that first saying that we have here in the tradition, which says nothing is yours, means, you know, it's not yours. This energy is not yours, whether heavy or light energy. It is for you and for you to consciously discern and use what best serves you. And that's why we've been giving this gift of our willpower to choose. So the first thing we learn about energy here is to constantly choose the light energy because that's the happiness, that's love, that's joy, that's the wonderful process of life where the heavy energies are more about struggles and suffering and crises and Pucha. hurts and evil. Hucha, yes. So and Sammy is it, the light and Hucha is the dark energy. Yes. So wonderful you speak all these Quechua words. I'm going to sing a Quechua song. I actually sing with a medicine band and I'm learning a Quechua song and I, I love the language. <laughs> so cool. So we learn about these. Uh, we learn about these energies. We learn about these uh, heavy energy, light energy, Hucha and Sami, and uh, we constantly work with Sami to learn through love, and we constantly transform whatever Hucha around us and for our families and our community. That's our work as healers, mostly. Oh my goodness! Okay, so powerful. So I want. I. I... I had somebody write in this question and I want to skip to it because this is such a perfect moment because you mentioned healers and you mentioned sensitivity and then you mentioned healers being here really to transform for humanity or one person at a time and the planet, all the above, or, which are all living entities, how to take that Hucha energy into the lighter high vibration Sammy. So uh, somebody wrote in this question, how do we as sensitives, Puma, live and continue to heal ourselves and Pachamama without being drained, without getting sick or without losing spiritual power? By becoming a sacred staff. This might sound weird, but here in the Andes, the main God that represents the absolute sun is uh, it's a being who is with his beautiful sun rays glowing all around his head, holding two staffs. Mm -hmm. And the two staffs are um, with a condor head at the bottom and with a puma head on the right-hand side and with two serpent heads on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. And when you see these staffs very well, they're actually the vertebra. They're the spine backbone of human beings. And um, the reason why the one on the left has two serpent heads is because only a woman can carry two consciousness and because of her womb. And the one with the puma head represents the masculine staff. The myth and the legend says that God creator has stored the most powerful force of creation, the most powerful force of manifestation, the most powerful sublime force of the universe in two of the most fragile staffs. And that's each one of us. So when you are a staff, you remember that you are constantly channeling. You are only a conduit of these cosmic forces. So because you, are, uh, because you are channeling these energies, whatever you do in your healing work, you are constantly being revitalized, renewed, recharged. Because it's not your physical, emotional, psychological energy that is being used. Mm -hmm. You are using cosmic forces. Yes. And this is why 
here in the Andes, we say that the strength and the power of a healer is his level of communion, what his or her alliances are, because they're constantly backing you. So the healer actually never uses his own energy or her own energy in the healing work. I completely understand this because uh, as I shared with you right before we started, Monday was my graduation after six months of an incredibly intensive shaman school, shaman energy practitioner school. And they said that enforce that over and over again to us, that you are calling in the lineage. You're calling in the ancestors. You're calling in Wakantanka, great spirit to come work through you. It's not you doing the healing to come work through you. So that makes so much sense. And then if you're a conduit for that healing to come through for another or a group, then that makes sense. As a conduit, you would also be receptive to receiving the goods, right? That you get filled up again or filled, not that you're, mm, but you get filled up by great spirit for the work you're doing, that you're, uh, given the battery power to keep going. Does that make sense? It does. Um, the, the only other thing that I would like to share about that is because we are also human beings and because we care and we love, we are also transmitting our own essence, our own light. We are giving that, uh, that light that we carry from within. Uh, it's what we call this sacred flame or sacred fire that we have inside that we have all been gifted with to, to walk or journey throughout life. Our fire needs to be really alive in strong vitality and is always fed with breath because that air feeds fire. So um, when we want to constantly revitalize ourselves, as nothing goes one way, when we are shining this light, when we are shining our essence, sometimes we are taking on pucha energy, heavy energy. And that is what actually drains us, because that is energy that hasn't been transformed, and it's weighing heavy on us. So for this reason, we always say that whenever we are giving we are giving energy of that sacred fire within with each breath. Whenever we are receiving, we receive into a crystal body because crystals have a powerful program on Mother Earth. They cannot channel heavy energy. Crystals can only conduct highly refined energy. So if you become a crystal being, if you visualize yourself inside a crystal as you breathe in, you are bringing in energy, vitality, light energy, and of the highest frequencies of vibrations. Even if there was kucha around you, it has no choice but to be transformed before it enters into your energy field. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you. I want to get clear. Are you a shaman? Are you known as a shaman? Now I am called a shaman, but in my training times as, as a kid, I was uh, always uh, known as a Paco. A Paco is a high priest. And uh, in ancient times, they used to be uh, compared to the white alpacas. They're the cameloids of the Andes. Yes. And the reason why they were compared to the white alpacas is because we constantly needed to be pure in our hearts. We constantly needed to be pure in our mind. Only then could we be of best service to our family and our community. This is something I'm a little sensitive to, so I'm hoping you will clear this up. So for instance, having just graduated, I mean, six months, that's baby time, toddler time, compared to for you, First of all, being born into the lineage of this medicine man being passed down and now shaman and what you have gone through to become this. I'm sure it wasn't all pleasant and magic and games. I'm sure there were some very difficult things for you to face over the decades. 
And so I just want to clear it up because in today's world where uh, ayahuasca especially is served, and I think they, they meaning people in general, tend to call that facilitator of ayahuasca a shaman just because they're pouring medicine. And also, you know, just the fact that I graduated from six months and I'm so grateful I did, but I would never call myself a shaman. So can you clear that up? I'd love to hear from you, a real shaman's perspective, what the truth is on this. So for us, you have to be hit by lightning in order to be chosen by the gods, in order to receive these traditions. Oh my God, I hope he wasn't just hit by lightning. <laughs> That's wild. Puma, I don't know if you're there, but your screen just went down when you said that. So come back to us, please, intact. Well, while we wait for him, and he may have also connection issues going on, I'm going to give out his website one more time. And it is. Now, the best pronunciation for me is Nokan Kani. So it's N O Q A N K A N I dot com. And um, he's actually being incredibly humble so far because from a very young age, he had to step into a role and a very, very global, visible role in order to mm, facilitate the mission that he came here to do and be. And so he was speaking at you know global united functions as an incredibly young man being featured in a star-studded, like, let me see if I can find this. I'm actually gonna do a quick search. Um, yeah, he was featured in a film called Four Real, the number four, R-E-A-L, with Cameron Diaz and Soul Guy, and it was a TV documentary series, and it featured, at the time, young leaders who, under extreme circumstances, are affecting real change on some of the most pressing issues of our time. So for him to step into all of this at such a young age and carry so much passion, and he does a lot also for the youth to help them. And that's beautiful. Welcome back. You said someone needs to be struck by lightning and you went away and I was really afraid for you. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> uh, we can't hear you. Well, we got, we got picture. <laughs> now we know you need sound. That's very interesting that that happened energetically at that time. So I'll also, we're, I'll tell you that we're coming up on some great conversation about the healing essences of the Pleiades and um, creating harmony and taking something from ancient Incan times and making it for modern times. Okay, you are back. Awesome. Sorry about that. The whole electricity went. So... Uh... Do you really need to be struck by lightning? Like, <laughs> was that for me? This is, <laughs> this is the tradition, but here's the thing. You know, here in the Andes, when a lot of people get struck by lightning, only a good 20% survive. So our ancestors built temples on whole mountainsides on the shape of a lightning so that anybody that went there could be struck by lightning and receive a spiritual initiation. What does it mean? It means that being hit by lightning is more a self-realization rather than the actual event of being hit by lightning. Because the, 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 as, you, as I was telling you, it's possible that you may not survive. So our ancestors made that even a safe ceremony for generations to come. There's a temple called Sahsei Waman, and it was built in the shape of a lightning. And whenever you go through these temples, you become illuminated, you become initiated. So being a shaman, becoming a shaman, is more of a self-realization and a self-choice path. 
nowadays we use this word that comes from Siberia to be a shaman. I heard from some of these masters that that word means to be clever, which is very important because we have, we have to use our creativity. We have to use our unconditional love in order to be of best service to our family and our community. And we do that in seamless, effortless ways. So to be a shaman, you just need to choose yourself. You need to realize yourself. And then you will manifest the, the best teachers, guides who will assist you in the process. It is not like in ancient times. I, I know you were talking about my training and how, for example, I learned about oracles and I learned about uh, rituals of transforming energy for 12 years. And I was not able to practice those in all that time until I was in my 18, 19 years. So nowadays it has changed. We are living in very accelerated healing times and everything has accelerated. And so did our learning process, our self-realization process, our enlightenment process has completely changed. So we can no longer live by those traditions. It has completely changed. If you are meant to walk in this path uh, in better service with ceremonies and rituals and all these traditions, you have no choice but to do it. Wow. We're living in times where you will be constantly exposed, constantly shown the signs and the call will become uh -huh. louder and louder and louder. Yes, 100% so much of what I've experienced that thank you I I'm really curious if you would talk about how young were you or what age did you start drinking and ingesting medicina um for me it started very uh, at a very young age also mm -hmm. uh, in these mountains the tradition of working with San Pedro the the cactus medicine Pachuma. Uh, it's very common, Apu Wachuma. Mm -hmm. And I started working with it since I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. and, uh, by then, I was already trained by my grandfather in ceremonies and rituals and mastery of all energy works. So I was mostly receiving this medicine from powerful masters um, for myself. And with ayahuasca, I started when I was 16. It was when I went as a big group to the Yawanawa community in Brazil, where a lot of young leaders from different parts of the world were gathering to, to strengthen the indigenous identity of the land. And there was this issue about indigenous and non-indigenous non people. And I was always saying that we're all native to Pachamama now. We're all native to this sacred land. And we, we might be indigenous through some lineage, through some traditions, but not even that we can be attached to. We are not from this earth. We come from the stars. If you ask anybody in the communities, the elders, where we come from, they will point out the constellations. They will point out the way home, where we all come from. So mm -hmm. that's why we don't belong to any of these earth uh, races, or lineages or indigenous communities to take it for granted. They're here for us again, but they're not ours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you, there, there was this um, cosmic program and it was called Hatun Mune. Yes. And it was for creating complete harmony and it was ancient Incan tradition. Um, do we have a Hatun Mune for modern times, something we can use now? Yes. So Hatun Mune Neo were the powerful masters who used to channel this cosmic willpower. So whatever is happening on our earth is not happening randomly. It is being monitored. It is being guided by cosmic intelligent forces, much more evolved than ours here on this earth. So when we catch up with them, we realize that we just 
changed uh, an era. About 10 years ago, in the 2013, 2012, 2013 was the time when a whole era when we were unevolved human beings has been completely uh, changed. We are now highly evolved beings. We are in the new era where we all have no choice but to wake up into superior consciousness. So these are the powerful times in which we are now. And that is the Hatun Munai that we need to catch up with. Mm -hmm. And when you're healing yourself or healing another, do you utilize the animals from the four directions? Do you see out of the eyes of serpent or track like jaguar, um, fly or enjoy the nectar like hummingbird or you know, have this beautiful vista view like eagle, condor? Do you use them in your practice? So I'm going to... I'm going to share with you a very powerful principle that I learned from my grandfather as I was becoming a global healer. We don't heal anybody from anything. But we can take on anybody's process, even just with a thought, even just with a breath. And whatever is causing so much suffering for you, for me, it will be a simple healing process such as a breath, and it will all be transformed. So what grandfather used to say, what our teachers used to say constantly is, you are only healing yourself. While you're healing family, while you're healing community, you are only healing yourself. So you're healing yourself first, and you're healing yourself last. And as you, that is why the most powerful focus for a healer is not to go heal somebody, is to go support everybody in their healing process by taking on some of that process and transforming it ourselves. So what we learn is rituals. What we learn is ceremonies to transform these processes in fast, ways, accelerated ways. Oh my goodness. I'm ready to board a plane to Peru. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> you mentioned the stars. And I love when we open sacred ceremony, we talk about the star nations and our star brothers and sisters. So can we talk a little bit about the seven starlight rays and the healing essences of the Pleiades? Because you're mentioning using, using ritual, journey, ritual journeys, ceremonies, awakening. And that also, of course, woven in there is the sacred feminine. And I think that's really important here on Earth right now, this era of the goddess. So can we talk about how that all ties in together? So we have activated the seven rays, which are pathways, portals, bridges, to our sacred Pleiades constellation, each one of them being powerful goddesses, benefactor goddesses. And there is, um, in the temples that were built for them, there is a lot of secret medicine that was uh, stored for us in those, in those sacred temples. What we always learn from our divine uh, goddesses is that for this earth, and for everyone who lives here in this earth, the Pleiades will always support abundantly with anything that we need to receive, manifest generously with, in our lives, with love, with happiness, with good health, with finance, with everything. So the Pleiades is the responsible of the abundance in your life. According to how much communion, connection you have with these stars, with these goddesses, you're going to manifest in your life. So because our ancestors were very close communion with this star constellation, they were always rich. They did not believe any human being should experience misery here because we live in a land where Mother Earth will give you abundantly, where we have these seven goddesses here for you, for whatever you need. Like, 
there is nothing in this earth that the Pleiades cannot give you and not give you only, but to give you abundantly. So for us, it's a very powerful uh, benefactor goddess that we connect through the rainbow lineages. Each ray represents miracles, magic. It represents um, wisdom. It represents wealth, health, so much that we are receiving from them. So um, it is very important to connect with the Pleiades at these times. We see them as Olkas. Olkas are, each star was a storehouse. So a storehouse of love and happiness, a storehouse of wisdom and sacred intelligence, a storehouse of um, wisdom, a storehouse of good health, of courage. What do you need here in life? There is abundant stored for you in the Pleiades. How can we embody that? How can we invite that in right now, that connection? Is it through prayer or is there something we can do to have I hunger personally for direct communication? And every morning I do a shamanic practice and I definitely speak to my star family and invite them in. And I'm always clear, even if they're not family from the stars, as long as they're benevolent being, if they want to connect um, that feels super important to me on my journey. How can we do more of that and actually create that connection? Uh, you don't have to know the Inca names for it. In fact, whatever ancient name there are for each star mm -hmm. uh, would work. You need to have seven stones or seven crystals. Mm -hmm. And in the system of altar, you know, a little altar that you can have, in those seven crystals, you need to call in the name of each of these stars and breathe on it three times like this, so that you are programming the essence of each of these Pleiadian goddesses to these crystals so that they're with you. And um, that is the start. You need to have them in an altar. You need to call on them because that calling that we can practice is very important. Remember, nothing goes one way. So when we reach out to the Pleiades, the Pleiades reach out to you. They have no choice. There's a universal force that says nothing ever goes one way. That's called Aini here in the Andes. So they have no choice but to connect with you also when you call on them. So that's how you start first in an altar. And how would we know the names of the goddesses to blow into each of the stones? Uh, we have in so many traditions, the names that they have. Uh, some of them are in, in Quechua for us. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, you know, in ancient, every ancient culture throughout the, throughout the planet has always been connected to the Pleiades mm -hmm. and um, to the goddesses and to the gods of the stars, because our ancestors knew very well the difference between stars and planets. Mm -hmm. They used to call the planets the walking stars because mm -hmm. they were constantly moving. They were constantly aligning. They were constantly um, visiting different constellations. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, these walking stars, the planets are also powerful allies. And the homes or the stations in the Milky Way, which are the constellations such as the Pleiades, represent powerful sources of energy. So all you have to know, even before you know their name, is who you are connecting with. So if it's the Pleiades you're reaching out to, then even just calling them as the Pleiadian goddesses come to be in ceremony with me, I call on you to assist me, to guide me, to bless my sacred space, my path, my journey. Um, they will do that for you. And um, if, for instance, my inception was Elohim and also Liran, like a lot of lifetimes on Lyra, would I include that in the seven stones? I would absolutely include the Pleiades, but could I include that as well? Yes, of course. 
yummy and Andromeda. I'm all about it. That's going down. I'm going to do that. Thank you for that ritual. That's so powerful. We have um, lots of, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about star confederations, yeah. there are, of course, hierarchies of them. But one of the ones that was always close to our planet and to our solar system is from Andromeda. We have a lot of beings that are constantly visiting our planet. They're bringing new knowledge. They're bringing new information, new technologies, exactly what is needed as our evolution is happening. Mm-hmm. That could be a whole rabbit hole. Well, I'm, I want to ask you like further along the line with this uh, this goddess and this feminine power. I think we're living in a really interesting time. I don't know if you'd agree, but I feel like all the things that stress people out, it's coming up to be healed, right? Things are happening on the planet and to humanity because it's time. It's time to write those. It's time to have peace. It's time to have abundance. It's time to honor the greatest mother of all, Pachamama. And can you talk about the correlation between Pachamama and the abuse of women? Is there a correlation there? Abusive women. What do you mean by that? Well, the denigration of women, uh, mistreatment of women. You know, there's many countries where women have to wear a certain garb or are not allowed to read and not allowed to go to school. And there's a lot of control of women. And I mean, there's, a, there's as we know in history, real history, uh, females were once the goddess head, right? And had a power and then something changed along the lines and we gave up our power, men took power. And this is not anti-men, anti-anything. But I think anybody who looks out in the world can see there's a lot that could be made right for women, pay and treatment and uh, sexual practices, you know, and rape and all sorts of things. So even us saying whatever for our own bodies, you know, in this country alone, I think it's madness that a government or a state can get involved and say, you can have abortions, you cannot, like, it's crazy. So is there a correlation between what humanity does to Mother Earth and what humanity does in general to women? I hope that makes more sense. There is, now I understand you. There is definitely because all women are Pachamama. For example, if we want to learn about what Mother Earth is about, we need to learn from our grandmothers, mothers, sisters, daughters, granddaughters. You know, we just need to learn from the divine feminine. In, in the Andes, we had a very strong communion with the divine feminine for a lot of people believed here in the Andes at some point, it was a matriarchal culture. What I believe and what I know from my journeys with grandfather into the ancestral times is that there has always been a dance, hopefully not a battle, but a dance between powers who is more powerful, the feminine, the masculine. And from time to time that used to happen. So, in these latest times, the divine feminine can no long, longer take any oppression. Pachamama is supporting her daughters to bring back balance between the divine masculine and divine feminine. Because for hundreds of years, there has been um, an oppression to the divine feminine. Now this energy is going to catch up very fast. It is not going to take thousands of years like it took for the divine masculine. It's going to be very fast. Even our generations are going to see the power of the divine feminine manifesting. And this is the energy of Pachamama waking up as powerful consciousness, not only in women, but also in men to contemplate, to support, to assist, and to welcome that process. We have no choice as men but to be present and witness such a powerful balancing uh, miracles happening throughout the planet for the divine feminine. So the times of oppression, we are the last of, the, of those unevolved generations. Mm. In the future, in order for there to be more balance in equilibrium, 
less of that oppression will be for the divine feminine. And um, that's why it needs to become neutral first. That's why a lot of people right now globally are going through a you know, feminine, masculine, neutral identity process because that's part of the cleansing, that's part of the healing. Eventually, because we all carry both polarities, we will be able to bring it into balance. So it's happening by powerful cosmic forces. It's happening because of Pachamama's call and we're catching up with it. In fact, all we have to do is catch up with it because it's happening. Tell me about your relationship with Pachamama. I'm curious about your relationship, like how specific it is for you with Mother Earth, with the Apus, with the mountains, with the animals. How is that for you? Uh, for us, Pachamama is the chief of all ceremonies, hmm. meaning whenever we are blessing sacred space, first we give thanks to Mother Earth. Because in this land, we can have this sacred space. Thanks to Mother Earth, we can have this sacred time. So Pacha in Quechua is time and space. And Mama is the mother of time and space. So we are referring to her as Pacha Mama, as a cosmic mother, the whole universal mother. But at the same time, we are referring to her as this sacred planet where everything happens where space and time can be together. Mm. So for that reason, she is our first and most important spirit ally. Then we have our Apus, beings of light that also came from the stars, but live in the land, in the mountains. They're called mountain spirits. And these Apus are guardians, are guides, are protectors. So we're constantly calling on them whenever we need support, whenever we need healing. So remember I was telling you, all women represent Pachamama for us. Mm -hmm. So the way we treat our women is the way we treat our Pachamama. Mm -hmm. So always, wherever we go, uh, if we go far ways or you come to visit here, we always consider you being the spirit of that land manifested through you. You are the Pachamama of the North manifested through you. So. Mm -hmm. We, we, we learn everything from you. We receive everything from you into our hearts as we are receiving it from Pachamama, from Mother Earth. And then the animal spirits. The animals are animals and plants are our older brothers and sisters. We are the last ones mm -hmm. in that family line. We are the immature young ones, the yes. humanity. Animal spirits, animals are our older brothers and sisters. Plants are our older brothers and sisters. They exist in a different frequency of vibration, in a different consciousness, in a different intelligence. So when we call on them, when we live with them, when we connect with them, what we are facilitating for ourselves is awakenings, growth, maturing, evolution. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? I've certainly experienced medicine. I've done whatever, like 28 journeys, uh, ayahuasca, yahe, huachuma, certainly, and, and many uh, different countries, ayahuasca. And I plan to drink again. I hadn't drunk for a year and a half, and I actually felt like I was complete. And then when I started this program, uh, grandmother is always very clear and grandmother ayahuasca tapped me. That's my experience. And she says, you know, I want you to come sit with me. So I did it once and I plan to do it again next month. And, and right now I'm just open. I feel like it's back for me. Can you make a recommendation for the most maybe open and receptive and powerful way to be with grandmother. Everything from the moment I would go up and hold the cup um, and to the moment I take the drink and and sit, you know, and let the experience begin. What are your recommendations? The most important is for you to have a clear intention of what you need from this ancestral spirit. 
it already knows you. It already uh, even knows your needs. Yeah. But when you become conscious of what you need, the medicine will prioritize that for you. So you can have a conscious communion, a conscious connection with this ancestral spirit that comes through these master plants. In order for that to be that powerful, you need to first work on your intentions. You need to have a very clear intent. And then you need to know that what you're receiving is an initiation, a healing directly from this ancestral spirit, directly from Mother Earth and not from a shaman. Because if you give the power to the person facilitating or to the shaman, that might limit or that might distract you from your communion with, the, with these master plant spirits. So even as, as um, facilitators of these ceremonies, as uh, healers and medicine people, we always say you're, you are receiving this medicine from Mother Earth. Um, you are having a direct communion with the sacred spirit. And we become only guardians of that sacred space. We become only powerful protectors to create a safe space. That's our job as medicine people. I know that when I went to another country uh, to participate and we did four back-to-back -back nights of medicine, and these were definitely lineage shamans that I was working with, it was a, an extraordinary experience they knew our intention and they would blow it into the cup before we drank it. And so if I'm not drinking with somebody who does that or knows how to do that, is that something I can do myself? If I know what I want to work on, what my intention is, can I blow that myself into the cup before I drink? Will that help? Yes, because what is necessary is for you to be conscious of your intention. The medicine already knows. The medicine already knows what you need, yeah. why you're coming. In fact, it's already been calling you. <laughs> it is. So true. When we work with the medicine that we always say to the people that come to the medicine, we say, you've been called, you've been chosen, yes. and you showed up. <laughs> now that you are here, leave it to Mother Earth, leave it to the medicine. Mm. Only miracles can come your way. That is so, so true. It's really been my experience. And I will tell you that after a year and a half of not doing medicine and thinking it was over, when grandmother Aya called me, uh, the message I heard was, now that you're in this shaman school, I want you to come sit with me. I have some wisdom for you. And so I went there fully expecting this is the intention. I'm going to get these huge shaman downloads. But I have to say that something else entirely happened that weekend. And she was working with me, the plant, for hours on my relationship with my mother. And it was at some point it actually got really exhausting and I had a call for some help. And, you know, the, the beautiful human being who was facilitating this said one sentence to me and I immediately made an adjustment and I actually surrendered. I thought, whatever it takes, I'm here for this experience. And the reason why this, I think this story is so important, I can feel myself getting really moved right now, is... I didn't know till a week and a half after that ceremony, my mother was going to die. And, and so this is amazing. This is how this grieving has been with my mom. I have nothing forever. And then suddenly there's a feeling. So here it is with you, but I'm so moved by the beauty of the plant. I have to say that she would call me. And even if it was under the guise of, I'm going to give you these downloads. And I really didn't get any shaman downloads, but I got a tremendous, um, amount of clearing with my mom. And I feel that she was facilitating me to prepare me for that experience. And I was able to sit with my mom when she was in the hospital and do shamanic death rites over her, everything to prepare her, you know, luminous energy field to go back and be taken by the ancestors. And I just, I have such great love 
for the plant, for that, for the wisdom to even call me before I drank and know what I needed. Mm. So beautiful. You know, we cannot give what we don't have. And as part of your training to be a very powerful medicine woman, you had to heal these feelings, these emotions for your mom, with your mom first. And then you could really support yourself as the divine feminine, and you will be able to support so many women around you. Mm. Thank you. I know, speaking of other countries, that you, Puma, lead pilgrimage as in Peru. So I'd really like to hear about that ancient sacred sites and transformation and rebirth. Uh, these are all the things that are on the website about what you do and offer. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, one of my main activities is to journey to these power places and uh, give rights of initiation, give rights of uh, uh, healing to everybody that come to visit our magical place. Mm -hmm. The thing is Peru in these last years have become a very powerful vortex activated for the planet. So it has a magnetic force calling as many people here to be in ceremony, wake up to this powerful, um, luminous, evolved, superior consciousness, and then with it be of best service for Mother Earth, for global family, for global community. So we're living in times where this magnetic force will continue bringing more people until that is complete. Then that energy is gonna move. We believe according to the prophecies, it's gonna to move to the North, to Turtle Island, and to, where the, to the land of the evil. And then from there is going to move towards Africa. So, that happens in over hundreds of years. These are powerful Pachacutis. So this time right now, Peru has that powerful energy active. So anybody that comes here will benefit from that magical um, energy. And I lead these journeys. I facilitate some of these portals, these sacred uh, initiations. And, uh, you know, we have a wonderful living culture here. Everything that we talk about of thousands of years ago, it's still alive in the practice, in the ways of life of the people here. Even though some of these practices have become Catholic practices, but they're not really Roman Catholicism, they're Andean Catholicism, because they're connected to the stars, to the Southern Cross constellation, to the Pleiades, to Orion, to the planets. So it's, it's very... Um, is the best times to visit right now this sacred land. I love, um, I love this. And when you talk about the rituals, are you talking about the 13 rites, one of the 13 rites, or is it something outside of that that you facilitate? It's, uh, it's outside of that. That comes from a specific tradition. Uh, we have different rites, we have different initiations. You know, for example, one of these initiations is what I was telling you. When you go to Saksai Waman, which is this archaeological site, everybody goes there because it's right in Cusco. It's this, you know, 200 weighing, 200 ton weighing rocks put together in ways that our physical science does not understand. So while a lot of people are going there just to visit and take photos, with us, they journey in a more conscious way they realize they're entering into the temple of the lightning and they're going to be illuminated and they're going to be self-realized. So we, we go through preparations, ceremonies, rituals for them to have that initiation. And the initiation is so simple. It's as simple as reaching out your hands and touching one of those gigantic rocks and receiving direct transmissions from Pachamama and from whatever prayers programs our ancestors have left there for generations and generations to come. So it's different. Our initiations are not uh, the same as the, the ones you were saying. Okay, beautiful. That's actually more exciting to me. And how long are these trips? And is there a lot of heavy hiking? What is it involved? 
Well, you know, our, our mountains, it's above 11,000 feet as you arrive to Cusco. And then from there, we journey as high as 14,000 feet. So we do need people to be fit for these mountains. Uh, the acclimatization process we facilitate. So usually this is very important, but most importantly, you need to come with your heart open, ready to receive magical gifts that are waiting for you here. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I know for myself, I have a morning practice that I do and I love my morning practice. It's actually allowed me to do something I've never been able to do before. I've never been great at meditating or anything like that, but I look forward to this. And something that I included in my morning practice is this connection. And sometimes it's with Pachacutec. Sometimes it's with Quetzalcatl. Sometimes it's, you know, with the underworld. Um, and I find actually a lot of love and solace. And for me, it's a real relationship. I feel that I have very real conversations with them and they often will give me wisdom, like incredible wisdom. Sometimes I laugh because it's so obvious and I hadn't considered it, but mostly I'm deeply moved and recentered, or I feel healed after that experience, you know, calm. Do you have being seen or unseen that you communicate with that you feel you have real relationship with? So for me, uh, Pachacamac and Wiracochan, they're the cosmic father, cosmic mother. They're the ones that I constantly journey with in meditations in journeys. Um, I used to see them in my dreams when I was little. Every day at 2 p.m., I would fall asleep while I was herding my sheep for about 20 minutes. But those 20 minutes in the dimension that they took me was lifetimes. And I used to journey with them always. So they called me into these powerful journeys. So ever since now, I call them to all my journeys. So they're the ones, Cosmic Father and Cosmic Mother, that I constantly talk with every day in ceremony. And oh, then, we, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. And then Mother Earth. Mm, mm -hmm. Yes. I think about that often too, the greatest mother of all. I mean, that is so big. It's so, she's so powerful when I consider who she is, how she created herself to be, what she can withstand, which I'd like to see stop. Um, and her, enormous beauty, but I also feel she has very strong boundaries. And I definitely commune with her as well. And I, I'm curious when you say this Viracocha, because, you know, what we learned is about opening sacred space, right? Um, and I don't know if this is familiar to you, or I might open sacred space over you. Um, and I've looked up the word before, but you're talking about it like an entity. Can you explain what do you mean by Viracocha? How does that so manifest? I will, I will begin by saying you cannot be here if it wasn't for the father and the mother. And um, that biological parents we have are only a physical manifestation of our cosmic parents. And our cosmic parents mm -hmm. is the divine cosmic mother and cosmic father. Cosmic Mother is sacred space, interestingly enough, and Cosmic Father is sacred time. Nice. So time is the father, space is the mother. So when you're opening sacred space for, for anybody or for yourself, you are calling in the mm. Cosmic Mother, really, because that's with Apocha. And that's so beautiful because that connects back to what you said about Pachamama and what that means. You said it's sacred time and space and mother, what the words literally mean. Yes. That's an incredible connection. Is there Puma? Why do they call you Puma? <laughs> it's a given name. It's a tradition. Uh, it's part of the lineage in my village. There's a lot of families with the Puma name. 
So it was because in the Andes, it represented the master of this physical world. Um, it was the, the one that was guarding and protecting life here on Mother Earth. So um, this, is the, this is the reason why I was given this name. Okay, thank you. Puma, so is there a prophecy that we should know about right now? People who are listening, uh, people who are watching? The Pachacuti prophecy is the one that is most important. Time goes through a complete shift every certain years, 500 years, 2,000 years, 12,000 years. And we have closed a very important cycle of 12,000 years where there was a program. The program was every generation will be less evolved than the last. That program is complete and it's over. Now we have reverted it. The Pachacuti is now that every generation will be more evolved than the last. So we're in that process of waking up and evolving in very fast accelerated ways. So we're in very exciting times because we're stewards, we're guardians of these new times. Oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Every time, especially in ceremony, I'm so privileged to sit with people much younger than me in their 20s, their 30s. And the last ceremony I was in, they had children there um, who had drunk. And, you know, at first it's kind of like, oh, you know, is that a safe thing to do? And then it's, it's I suddenly realize, of course it is, it's a plant, right? <laughs> you're, you're ingesting mother nature that has wisdom. And uh, so I thought, ah, oh, these children are going to be amazing when they grow up. So I'm very taken by how they are, the younger generations, their sense of community, their sense of acceptance of all ages, their commitment. I mean, they really came here, I think, to live something special out loud. I'm moved by it. So let me ask you the final question. This is Dare to Dream, Puma. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? I dream for our community, our global family, to arrive through these powerful healing, powerful awakening processes in the most gentle ways. We have had the heart process. We no longer need any more of these heart processes. We need to call in more Sami into our lives. Our teachers used to say, whatever you don't learn through love, you learn through pain and through crisis. And the medicine for this new era is, whatever you don't learn through love, you learn through unconditional sublime love. So through love, yes or yes, that's my dream. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And folks who want to connect with him, I've given out the website twice. It'll be in the show notes. And I end today's show with this quote, through interconnectedness, we walk a global healing path where love and compassion reign, transcending borders and divisions. Let us rise above our individual selves and unite as one, recognizing the sacredness of all life as we co-create a harmonious symphony with the universe. May our souls ignite like stars illuminating the night. Together, we shall weave a tapestry of unity, peace, and understanding, fostering a world where every being can thrive in the abundance of spiritual growth and conscious awakening. Let the light of our souls shine bright, casting away shadows of ignorance and fear as we dance in harmony with the divine rhythms of existence. Thank you for joining. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation. Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment. I read them all. And next week on the show, the guest is the amazing Gita Rose. She's a voice channel and also channels Bella of the Yael, the one heart of Gaia and extraterrestrial human hybrids. Be the medicine, everybody. Thanks for joining us.